Thank you for standing by and welcome to the iBio Fiscal 2021 Second Quarter Financial Results Conference Call. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. Later, we will conduct a question and answer session and instructions will follow at that time. If anyone should require assistance during the conference, please press star then zero on your touchstone telephone. I would now like to turn the conference over to your host, Stephen Kilmer, Investor Relations. Please go ahead. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Let me start by pointing out that this conference call will include forward-looking statements regarding iBio and its business. Often, but not always, forward-looking statements can be identified by the use of words such as may, might, will, should, believe, expect, anticipate, estimate, continue, predict, forecast, project, plan, intend, or similar, similar expressions, or statements regarding intent, belief, or current expectations are forward-looking statements. Such statements are based on the current expectations of management. The forward-looking events and circumstances discussed in this conference call may not occur by certain specified dates or at all and could differ materially as a result of known and unknown risk factors and uncertainties affecting the company, including risks regarding the company's ability to obtain regulatory approvals for commercialization of its product candidates or to comply with ongoing regulatory requirements, regulatory limitations relating to its ability to promote or commercialize its product candidates for specific indications, acceptance of its product has candidates in the marketplace, and the successful development, marketing, or sale of products, its ability to maintain its license agreements, the continued maintenance and growth of its patent estate, its ability to establish and maintain collaborations, its ability to obtain or maintain the capital or grants necessary to fund its research and development activities, competition, or its ability to, ability to retain its key employees. Although iBio is, has attempted to identify important factors that could cause actual, res, actual actions, events, or results to differ materially from those described in these forward-looking statements, there may be other factors that cause, actions, that cause actions, events, or results to differ from those anticipated, estimated, or intended. No forward-looking statement can be guaranteed. Except as described by applicable securities laws, forward-looking statements speak only as of the date on which they are made, and iBio undertakes no obligation to publicly update or revise any forward-looking statement whether as a result of new information, future events, or otherwise, other than as required by law. On the call today, representing the company are Mr. Tom Izet, iBio's Chairman and Chief Executive Officer, and John Delta, iBio's Principal Accounting Officer. With that said, I'll now turn the call over to Tom. Great. Thank you, Steve, and good afternoon, everyone. So I would like to start off by thanking the small team of people who helped start the transformation of iBio in late 2019 and the investors who believed in us. That group brought passion, energy, and the belief that we could use the power of plants to not only help other companies speed the development of their products into the clinic, but to also use our own technologies and scalable manufacturing platform to create our own portfolio of biological medicines to address unmet needs in human and animal health. In 2020, we combined our new glycaneering technologies with our fast farming system to significantly enhance our protein engineering capabilities. That led to growing interest in our CDMO services while jumpstarting work on our proprietary vaccines and therapeutics. There were plenty of skeptics who didn't think that plants could work as well as traditional mammalian cell production systems, but we added a few converts to our team and even introduced a new business model that led to a novel partnership, enabling us to accelerate the formation of our research and bioprocess business. With three new businesses added to our existing services portfolio, we invented, invested in recruiting experienced and talented leaders to help us build and grow these four segments. Now, here in 2021, we have a growing pipeline of biopharmaceuticals for human and animal health indications. Our lead COVID-19 vaccine candidate attempts to anticipate the potential for new coronavirus mutations with a design that includes the spike antigen as well as other more conserved viral proteins. If COVID-19 evolves into a seasonal illness, as many expect, experts are beginning to predict, then a subunit vaccine carrying multiple SARS-CoV-2 antigens that can be rapidly modified and scaled, like iBio201, could address some of the still significant unmet needs associated with recently introduced mRNA and adenoviral vaccine platforms. Meanwhile, we're advancing our lead antifibrotic molecule by optimizing its efficacy, safety profile, and manufacturability. And with the creation of our new animal health organization, we're accelerating our work to bring our classical swine fever vaccine forward, 
which includes our effort to secure important regulatory approvals for our fast farming facility in Texas. As significant as this progress may be, the advances we've made to establish a pipeline of human and animal health candidates is only part of the work our dedicated team has been focused upon. We've overcome the challenges of the pandemic to dutifully serve our CDMO clients and continue to deliver on the projects that we have underway with the likes of United Therapeutics, Safi Biosolutions, and ATB Therapeutics, amongst others. More generally, we're seeing our innovative fast farming system gain traction in the contract manufacturing services segment. So we expect that with our new commercial initiatives, reflected in part by our recently launched website, that we'll be able to spread the word about all the advantages of our truly green platform, including speed, scalability, and quality. And notably to that last point, we've enhanced our monoclonal antibody engineering and characterization capabilities, which should make fast farming even more attractive to certain market segments. Bottom line, we believe the fast farming platform provides sustainable competitive advantage by stripping time and cost from the early stage biologics development cycle. And we're confident that we've built a strong multifaceted biotech and CDMO around it to capitalize on the optionality it provides and to return value to our shareholders. We couldn't be more grateful to our employees, vendors, strategic partners, and investors for their efforts and support with our transformation. But before I go into our quarterly developments and positioning for the remainder of FY21, I'll turn the call over to John to review our fiscal second quarter 2021 financial results. John? Thanks, Tom. Good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to provide a brief update on our financial results for the quarter ended December 31st, 2020. To streamline things, all of the numbers I will mention have been rounded and are therefore approximate. For the three month period ended December 31st, 2020, iBio reported revenue of 700,000, an increase of 400,000 from the same quarter last year. Total operating expenses, consisting primarily of research and development, or R&D, and general and administrative, or G&A, expenses for the quarter ended December 31st, 2020, were $8.3 million, compared with $3.5 million for the same period last year. R&D expenses for the quarter ended December 31st, 2020, were $2.4 million, compared with $900,000 in the same period a year ago. The increase is primarily related to an increase in laboratory consumables, supplies, and higher R&D personnel costs. G&A expenses for the quarter ended December 31st, 2020, were $5.8 million, compared with $2.6 million in the same quarter last year. The increase resulted primarily from higher professional and consulting fees, including recruiting, as well as facility repairs and maintenance, public company costs, insurance, and board of director fees. Other expense for the quarter ended December 31st, 2020, was 600000 which was consistent with the same quarter a year ago. As we move forward in our current quarter, and with the establishment in January of our dedicated R&D group, led by our new chief scientific officer, we will be able to provide more visibility in regards to our R&D, G&A, and cost of goods sold expenses. In Q3, we will begin reporting on revenues and expenses associated with the three new profit centers within iBio Inc., which include therapeutics, vaccines, and research and bioprocess products. We have been making significant investments in people, processes, and infrastructure to match our progress and position in our life cycle. We believe that creating this solid foundation provides the expertise and capabilities needed for a high-quality biotech company and will serve iBio well as it moves forward with its value-creating objectives. That said, as we continue to advance our clinical pipeline, we expect growth in R&D expense to begin significantly outpacing G&A expense moving forward, especially with the aforementioned expense visibility we will be providing. Net loss attributable to iBio stockholders for the quarter ended December 31st, 2020 was 8.2 million, or four cents per share, compared with a net loss of 25.4 million, or 69 cents per share in the comparative period last year. As of December 31st, 2020, iBio had cash and cash equivalents, plus investments in debt securities of $107.6 million. With that, I'll turn, now turn the call back over to Tom. Tom? 
Thanks, John. Uh, while we're excited with our progress to date, of course, we remain focused on delivering results in the near term that will also create long-term success. We believe that our investments in innovation, processes, and people today will be foundational for achieving our long-term goals. To that end, we've added eight new leaders to the organization since the beginning of fiscal Q2, bringing with them a wealth of industry experience to our team. As you may have seen in our separate press release earlier today, our most recent addition comes with the appointment of Mr. Robert Lutz as Chief Financial and Business Officer. He will manage our financial operations, including reporting, budgeting, and strategic planning. And considering Rob's impressive background, working with commercial stage companies to secure complementary assets via licensing deals and partnerships, we believe he will be in position to readily contribute to the growth of our product portfolio. Joining Rob in our recently staffed C-suite is Randy Maddox, Chief Operating Officer, Lisa Middlebrook, Chief Human Resources Officer, and Dr. Martin Brenner, Chief Scientific Officer. In many respects, Dr. Brenner's appointment embodies iBio's transformation from a quiet CDMO into a dynamic biotech innovator and in leading biologics contract manufacturing organization. He has a strong history of success heading drug discovery and development teams at several of the world's leading pharmaceutical companies, including AstraZeneca, Lilly, Pfizer, and Merck. Most recently, Martin served as, as the CSO at Phoenix, an NYSEA-listed company which, using its novel protein expression technology platform, created an advanced pipeline of therapeutics, vaccines, biologics, and biosimilars. We believe Martin will be able to leverage his prior experience to drive the growth of iBio's proprietary product platform. And as a self-described drug hunter, we believe his skill sets with Rob's are highly complimentary. Ms. Middlebrook is a proven team builder with a strong bottom line focus. Coming to us from Lupin Incorporated, a global pharmaceutical company offering branded and generic formulations, biosimilars, and active pharmaceutical ingredients, Lisa has extensive experience delivering human resources strategies and recruiting talent. Notably, while at Lanza, a multinational CDMO, she led a global leadership development program. Rob, Martin, and Lisa joined Mr. Randy Maddox, who was appointed COO in November, coming to us from GSK via Aptivo, as well as Dr. Melissa Berquist, who was named head of animal health programs in October. Along with those recent additions, we greatly enhanced our biopharmaceutical industry experience on our board with the appointments of Dr. Linda Armstrong, Dr. Alexandra Kropotova, and Gary Sender early in Q2. So please join us in welcoming all to iBio as they help us execute on our strategy. So turning now to developments with our biopharmaceutical pipeline, I'd like to provide a few de details on the advancement of our COVID-19 vaccine candidate. We recently completed the end of life phase of IND enabling toxicology studies for our subunit vaccine, iBio201. The data is currently being analyzed by our contract research organization, and we expect to report pathology results in early Q4, FY21. Although there are approved vaccines now on the market, we still see a need for a continued development of alternatives given evolving mutations, as well as global distribution and access constraints for the current products. As most of you know, we selected iBio201 as our leading COVID-19 vaccine candidate based upon its production of higher anti-spike neutralizing antibodies compared to our VLP vaccine platform, iBio200. iBio201 is based on a subunit platform that combines antigens derived from the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein fused with our patented LICAM booster molecule to enhance immune response. The addition of the LICM booster to a subunit antigen may provide improve the likelihood of achieving single dose prolonged immunity. Additionally, considering the emergence of circulating mutations of COVID-19, we recently began designing a next-gen subunit vaccine with 201 that includes the spike, or S protein, plus the nucleocapsid, or N protein. We're using fast farming to build the N plus S versions with the idea that if the LICM toxicology results are favorable, we would take those two, both N and S, with LICM, test them with other adjuvants, and evaluate results. By the way, the same concerns around possible escape mutants that drove our decision to develop the N plus S vaccine provided the rationale for us signing the H2FC deal with Planet Biotechnology back in August. 
This COVID-19 therapeutic candidate is a recombinant protein comprised of human angiotensin converting enzyme 2, or H2, fused to a human immunoglobulin G, FC fragment. As H2 also is the target receptor for the coronavirus's entry into cells, we believe the candidate will bring the benefit of traditional neutralizing the antibody while prospectively limiting the potential for viral escape. We can continue to see there is a potential strategic advantage in that approach in light of what we're seeing with competing therapeutics. And we're now watching the regulatory and competitive landscape for opportunities to make H2FC part of the solution. Turning to our lead animal health product, with the help of Dr. Berquist, we're planning to submit an outline of production for a U.S. veterinary biologics establishment license as part of the development of iBio 400 our classical swine fever vaccine. If we secure such a license, it will enable us to expand our development capabilities across our organization and open a constructive pathway for this and other veterinary vaccines and therapeutics. Keep in mind this is an initial, albeit important step in what is often a multi-year approval process. Meanwhile, we're planning to start an efficacy study in June on iBio 400 with a large safety study to follow later in 2021. In addition to the progress with iBio 400, we're excited to announce the patent issuance covering endostatin peptides for treating fibrosis. The claims cover a novel expression cassette that enhances the yield of endostatin fragments and variants using our fast farming system. These patent claims are foundational to our work on antifibrotic therapies and support the development of our product candidate, iBio 100, for the treatment of systemic scleroderma and idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis as potential lead indications. We continue to make preparations to launch the last of our IND enabling studies, which will be followed by GMP manufacturing. As much as we are excited about the future of our therapeutic human and animal health pipeline, the emerging success of our CDMO business has also given us confidence in our ability to execute and deliver differentiated solutions to biologics manufacturers. Our fast farming system and glyconeering technologies have unlocked multiple runways of opportunity for our internal product catalog and service capabilities, which can be seen in our CDMO agreements this year. During the quarter, we continue to diversify our customer base with the ATB Therapeutics Agreement. ATB Therapeutics will use iBio's fast farming system to produce its bioengineered antibody toxin fusion proteins. We are looking forward to helping the organization rapidly build a scalable manufacturing process as it prepares for its first safety trial. Our SAFI agreement continues to progress as we work towards generating CGMP growth factors and cytokines using our fast farming system. This agreement has become a significant revenue contributor, driving the quarter over quarter and year over year growth. We believe the SAFI agreements represent a great opportunity for us in two ways. First, we are able to grow our CDMO business and showcase our capabilities. And number two, we are able to start building our own catalog of high quality proteins for research and further manufacturing uses. The proteins we are building with SAFI that are not designated as customs by them can be commercialized by us. The opportunity for iBio is that if a manufacturer buys a product from our RBP, or Research and Bioprocess Catalog, for a specific delivery system or product candidate, we'll get specified for use in their manufacturing process as they move through their own clinical trials. Furthermore, a number of these products could be translated to our own new proprietary product candidates. We plan to begin offering a new catalog of these high-quality research and bioprocess proteins by mid-calendar 2021, initially focused upon growth factors and cytokines. Overall, we remain very encouraged by our growing success in CDMO services, driven by the combined technologies of fast farming and glyconeering. I'm also excited for the opportunities across our therapeutics and vaccine product candidate pipeline, as well as for our emerging RBP business. Importantly, I believe we now have the requisite leadership and expertise within our organization to maximize both our current and future opportunities. Thank you. And with that concluding our highlights, we are happy to take any questions you might have. Operator? At this time, I would like to remind everyone, in order to ask a question, press star, then the number one on your telephone keypad. Again, that is star, then the number one on your telephone keypad. We'll pause for just a moment to compile the Q&A roster.
We have our first question coming from the line of Kristen Kliska with Cantor Fitzgerald. Your line is open. Hi, everyone. Thanks for taking my questions, and congrats on the progress, hires, as well as your new website. So my first question is, last week one of the companies in Phase 3 development for IPF announced the discontinuation of their autotaxin inhibitor, citing the benefit risk profile, excuse me, no longer supported continuing the studies. So perhaps I could ask you, based on the mechanism of action of iBio100 and what you've seen in preclinical studies, why you think your therapy could be differentiated and overcome some of the hurdles we've seen in the space. Yeah, thanks, Chris. A great question. You know, we, we saw that development with interest, of course, that uh, ATX inhibitor class. I think the whole class actually may get called into, into jeopardy here. And, you know, that, that combination, you know, the safety and efficacy questions that are associated, um, you know, when, when we take a look at our MOA, of course, it's quite different um, than, than theirs. And so as we as we've taken a look at our particular product, one thing that we have some relatively high confidence about is going to be its safety profile. I mean, this is ultimately just, you know, a derivative of, of collagen um, here that we're talking about. So, uh, you know, relative to the opportunities that we see ahead, you know, with what we've done um, with some of our preclinical work, and by the way, that that's sort of in two areas. We have a you know, sort of a traditional mouse model that's used for testing uh, idiopath against the idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, um, where we saw really good results versus the standards of care right now, uh, nintenanib and propinidone. Um, but but also too on diseased human lung explants, um, our data was really good. So we saw not only stasis but you know reversal um, in both of those particular models. So. You know, we're, we're optimistic that, you know, with a, with an important dropout in the competitive landscape for development here to treat some of these diseases, um, for which you, you know, I mean, there's not, there's hardly any great solutions in the, in the two that I just mentioned, Intenative and Perfinidone, of course, you know, a lot of patients can't even stay on those medications due to such poor tolerability. So, you know, we're hopeful that what we'll be seeing for iBio 100 as we, you know, get around to, you know, designing the, the trials and some of the rest is that, you know, at least from a safety and to tolerability standpoint, we're, we're certainly going to have our fingers crossed um, that we'll be able to, to deliver something there with the preclinical data that we have around the efficacy of the molecule. Um, we feel pretty good about that, too, which is why we're, um, you know, moving forward as quickly as possible to, uh, to try to get into the clinic. Great, thank you. And then on the COVID-19 uh, vaccine landscape front, could you further elaborate how you're thinking about how fast farming may allow for greater production and cost savings and kind of what you've seen and observed from some of the other key vaccine players so far? And then I also just wanted to elaborate on some of your prepared remarks. Um, so regarding the second generation vaccine that you have in development here, do you think you're going to have to conduct any further talks work similar to what you've done for the first generation or you would plan to move forward with them together assuming that this data um, next quarter for you will be positive? Yeah, let's do, uh, I guess, second question first. You know, the, uh, the hope is here that with the talks work that we're doing and taking a look at the booster molecule, the Lickinase or Lickn booster, that we can have the spike protein and the nucleocapsid kind of ride along with that um, and hopefully get uh, clearance to move forward from the agency. So uh, that's the expectation that we, we pair those two up uh, and, then, and then move forward. So turning to some of the unmet needs, you know, and, and I think the, the question's a good one around cost, especially when we take a look at what's going on and and access in certain places, not the least of which would be Africa and South America and the like. Um, you know, the cost is, is one component. The other thing I think worth noting is we've seen from, you know, the Pfizer and the Moderna vaccines, of course, is that, you know, they have those uh, pretty substantial cold chain requirements. And the question is going to become as we 
see if in fact this becomes a seasonal illness and we have not only new mutations uh, for which the current vaccines uh, may have a different uh, coverage level or, or efficacy, right? So what we've seen is in some of the early ones, uh, you were getting 90% and then that started to drop off prospectively. It could have been due to some of these new mutants. And then the question becomes, well, do you end up with whole entirely new strains too? So I think it's, as we consider what goes on, if we're going to have to be getting after this season after season, then the speed with which the mRNA vaccines can be produced to address new strains and mutants is really good. I mean, it, it rivals what we can do with fast farming. But then ultimately, if one was to go with a subunit vaccine, uh, then, you know, some of these cold chain requirements and some of the rest uh, would be matters that we could perhaps better overcome and uh, possibly, too, from the cost and access standpoint as well. So that's how we're looking at the evolution of the marketplace and as well as the disease and the disease state itself. So uh, for those reasons, we continue to invest behind the platform. As you well know, there's a couple of other players that had hats in the ring, even those that were involved in Operation Warp Speed who got substantial government funding that have uh, subsequently um, stopped production um, of their, or stopped moving forward with their development programs. Uh, but we see enough promise in what we have here to keep that going. And, you know, crucially, this is gonna depend on two things. A, our design strategy. Do we have it right that maybe, uh, you know, targeting the nucleocapsid protein? And this is not to say that we're not looking at some of the others too, but that more well-conserved protein might be a very good answer to help address more mutants um, of the virus as it occurs. And then, of course, we've got to get our toxicology study uh, or, or report back and, and have that all clear to go forward. But uh, assuming those two things to be true or uh, able for us able to move forward with, we would uh, we would look to bring this kind of solution here if it continues to head down the path where it looks like it'll be a seasonal illness. Great. Thanks so much, Tom. Thank you. Great questions. We have our next question coming from the line of Ben Hainer with Alliance Global Park. Your line is open. Hey guys, thanks for taking the questions. You know, just just thinking about the the veterinary side of things, and you know, the iBio 400. You mentioned that it might take a couple few years to get uh, kind of the, the the clearance to to uh, on the 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 FDA USDA uh, side of things, but. You know, how, what does the timeline look like for iBio 400 and, and, you know, when, when do you, or what do you anticipate investing to kind of take that to completion? Hey, Ben. Yeah, so great question. And, you know, it's interesting here when you take a look at the regulatory pathway on the USDA side of things, mm -hmm. it's a little bit like how the FDA used to be where you, actually have to have your manufacturing facility inspected by the by the FDA. Well, nowadays it's more incumbent upon the uh, developer, um, you know, to go ahead and, and uh, produce the information necessary to go ahead and you know, get, for instance, a, a BLA, a biologics license application. Whereas in the case of USDA, it's still the case where you have to pass a facility inspection. So they'll we'll send somebody out to, to check out the manufacturing facility itself. So what one has to do if you're interested in moving down the regulatory pathway in that instance is that you have your, your site license for your facility travel along with uh, your first product. And so to that end, we had uh, good data in progress on iBio 400, and what we need to do, of course, is kind of play a little bit of catch up towards getting the uh, facility moving down the same path to get a, um, uh, you know, an establishment license. So uh, this times 
well, in fact, for us because what we're going to be able to do is submit this outline of production, which is kind of the first step. It will be an outline of production for something specific in our case. That's going to be for the classical swine fever vaccine. And then concurrently, we're going to be doing a couple of uh, studies here so that we're in really good position around the same time as we're moving things through to get the uh, facility site license. We're going to have our, you know, our uh, efficacy and safety studies that come along with. Does that make sense? Oh, and by the way, the COVID has absolutely impacted uh, at least yeah. what we've seen and heard, um, you know, the USDA's ability to go ahead and process some of these new things. So, you know, we're mindful of that. Um, and there's a couple of steps that we're taking to try uh, to pull some of the time out. There's a few new procedures and, and things that we're looking at that could help with that. But, you know, we could see it. I mean, it could be as long as two years, depending upon uh, you know, uh, factors associated with the global pandemic. Got it. And, and then you, you mentioned the site license uh, travels along with the, the first product. I, I want to say, and then maybe I'm misremembering this, but um, are the products then uh, tied to the site? Uh, I seem to recall that being the part of uh, – uh, some of the USDA regulatory stuff on, on vaccines, but uh, correct me if I'm wrong there. Well, I'm not a regulatory expert on that one, Ben, but I think that's probably the way it works. Don't hold me to it. I'll, I'll get back and check it out. But, yeah, I mean, by virtue of the fact that you need the establishment license, yeah, I, I think that's, that's the case. So I, I don't know that it's easy to necessarily pack it up and, and move it. There may be a procedure for doing that. Um, but I think generally it, it does it does focus on that. Now, the, you know, my understanding of it as well is that I believe the good news is once you get it for your facility for one product, you can make other products out of there without having to go, you know, go through a whole uh, additional inspection process. But once again, I'm not the regulatory expert on that. I'll have to follow up with you. Well, well, and the, the USDA is kind of interesting on the the veterinary side in that you know for biologics there's really not a pathway for a generic or biosimilar to gain approval once once you you have something like that so that's always interesting of course um, and then just you know you mentioned the end of life phase for the IND enabling study on iBio two hundred one. Um, you know, I think this is taking longer than, uh, you know, some people had hoped, of course. It sounds like results in, in April. You know, are there any concerns or worries that, that you guys have with regard to toxicology that, uh, um, you know, we should be thinking about or? No, um, you know, it, it was really, I think, more than anything is, is looking at how the market evolved. And as we were going through whatever it was, I mean, keep in mind, you know, everybody else out there, um, certainly everybody who was part of Operation Warp Speed, um, you know, it had platforms and platform technologies that they'd been developing for a decade or more, right? And mm -hmm. so when it came time for, well, when, you know, the, the pandemic hit, you know, one could take your their platform, having already gone through, you know, something like toxicology, let's say, and, um, it, you know, and, and kind of skip that step and just load your antigen onto the platform. And, mm -hmm. frankly, that's what we were hoping we might be able to do with the virus-like particle platform, but we didn't see the same sort of uh, immunogenicity uh, you know, generated as we did with 201. So we were faced with that question of, well, now what do we do strategically? Or what do we do, you know, relative to efficacy? And then, you know, there was that period of, well, look, it looks like, every, you know, two, three, four other competitors were going to come out there with a solution and, you know, could iBio compete, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so what I would say is happily, you know, uh, here's little iBio where, you know, some global pharmaceutical behemoths have said, okay, well, we're stepping out of the, you know, out of the scene, um, either because of the efficacy of their vaccine and development or for other reasons, uh, whereas we felt confident in our 
thinking is, well, I don't want to say confident because there's still a lot of biology left to be done, but with our approach with a sort of a, the tried and true category of a subunit vaccine, um, when it comes to the safety and toxicology, actually I would say, no, we're not worried at all. As a matter of fact, we think, um, you know, that should be, should be Better. just fine. But we do need to, you know, run that like an ACE molecule through the tox. Um, we could get a surprise and find out that, okay, it, it, you know, it did not hit our expectations, but mm -hmm. we are not expecting, um, you know, we're expecting a, a more favorable, we think a more favorable outcome is, is likely and then we'll be able to move forward. Okay. Thanks for all the color there. That's definitely helpful. And then, um, you know, just on the, the research and bioprocessing side of things, you know, what what uh, have you seen as far as incoming interest there? Uh, um, you know, any color on, on that that you can provide? Well, not too much, only because we have not yet put the products into the catalog. Uh, but what I suppose I can say is that uh, certainly, we have gotten off to what we think is a very good start uh, with utilizing the platform to uh, pursue the you know, roughly dozen proteins as part of the program, or you know, cytokines and growth factors as part of what we're doing with SAFI. So, mm -hmm. you know, those uh, those are going along really well. We can make a lot of them. We made them quick, as uh, as suggested in our remarks. Um, we were able to deliver on those and, and thus get our revenue recognition fairly quickly. So that gives you a sense for the fact that we're able to turn on the fast farming machine and, and crank the products out and um, they look pretty good so far. Um, what I can say is that we've had interest um, from one or two others, but really uh, the proof is in the pudding when we get the products into a catalog. So we've got to, uh, you know, get them you know, fully ready for commercialization and launched. And then, of course, we're going to want to make them available online, let others test them, and, you know, really turn that business on. So that will be coming, as we suggested before, um, in the next few months. But sorry to add too much color here, I suppose. What we think could be really attractive for the mm -hmm. customer base that we're targeting is that many might choose to use these products first for research, uh, to maybe make a cellular therapy. And as mm -hmm. part of that, uh, oftentimes you have to add in, you know, a cytokine or a growth factor or something to the cell culture media. Well, the mm -hmm. good news about our platform is since it's plant-based, that means it's animal-free, and that means the risk of adventitious agents, they call them, or, mm -hmm. you know, uh, essentially, um, contaminants, right? Yep. Uh, this could be, you know, stuff for BSC or, you know, mammalian viruses or whatever, greatly reduced with a plant-based protein. Um, and then the fact that we can translate so quickly from research to uh, RUO-labeled product to further manufacturing use-labeled product, uh, we think creates notable competitive advantage for this line of products. It's not like there's not other competitors out there. But there's a couple of advantages here with using our system that you know we think will make uh, will make it a really interesting market, and we think we can uh, compete and grow that product line. If that Got it. No, that, that's great. Thanks. And then, lastly, for me, the any update on the Fraunhofer lawsuit, and uh, I'll leave it there. Thanks for taking the questions. Right. Thanks, Ben. Yeah, the uh, you know the it's still scheduled for trial uh, to begin March first. And uh, we uh, certainly see it as others do that we're, we're in the damages phase. Some would uh, uh, contend that the Delaware Court of Chancery's ruling back in 2016 was uh, very much in iBio's favor. So we think we're going to prevail. Uh, and I suppose we'll, we'll see in a matter of weeks. Good deal. Well, uh, best of luck to you there. Thanks, guys. All right. Thanks, Sean. We have our next question coming from the line of Jim Tassano, private investor. Your line is open. Hey, uh, thank you for taking my call. I have several questions, and I'll start with a couple of comments. Um, Tom, you know, I've um, been in iBio for 
two full years now, and I follow the company closely. And I wasn't on the call last time, but I did want to thank you because I know how hard it was to save the company back uh, in late 2019. That was an ordeal, and you know, I've spoken to many people. So I think very few people realize the difficulty involved in what you had to do. And uh, while I'm here, hey, I wanted to thank Steve Kilmer because he's been my go-to iBio source for two years, and he's performed fantastically. He's, he's the best, uh, best IR guy I've ever worked with. But anyway, let me, I have several questions I'd like to move on quickly. Um, you have a VLP platform that you developed for um, uh, 200, and 200 has kind of fallen off the radar. But the VLP platform looks to be one of the best in the industry, and it appears to have a need for some candidate molecules. Where are you at with the VLP platform? Well, Jim, two things. First, uh, you know, I thank you, of course, for having been with us uh, since the beginning. And it was uh, uh, certainly investors like you who I was referring to and, and wanted to say my thanks um, again for believing in us uh, back in those early days here of the, you know, of the transformation. Uh, secondly, with regards to VLP is maybe – you and others who uh, were shareholders at the time in the early stages, you, you may recall that that was the first platform uh, that we announced moving forward with, and it was for the reasons that you mentioned. You know, there's, um, you know, there's there was a lot of promise. The the VLP that we had in our early manufacturability studies looked really really good, and. You know, frankly, we got. We also wanted to pick that because we thought that we could get, um, you know, an exception uh, from FDA and be able to skip tox studies. And you know, it, it, that um, that was a good assumption on our part. But what uh, you know, what we've said and, and communicated a couple of times is that when we did the bake off, um, and we were fortunate that we ran a bake off. You know, we could have just assumed, well, look, everything will be, uh, you know, optimal with the virus-like particle platform and just taken one through the process. But fortunately, we said, well, look, let's give a, let's have a peek at what the subunit vaccine would do. And when it came down to it, just based on performance, you know, 201 was better. And it was a surprise, no doubt. Um, and then, of course, you know, we needed to go through the talks. Now, the um, silver lining to that is, you know, by, by getting the Lickinase platform through toxicology here, you know, hopefully that will be one, a platform that we can use going forward. So with regards to the VLP, the way in which we're treating that is that we do think it still has promise, but we need to work on it as a platform. And we've got, you know, a program in mind for that as to how to enhance it because, to your good point, uh, we are seeing others use the virus-like particle modality, if you will, uh, to good effect. And so we'd like to be able to move that forward. But, you know, in terms of uh, resource deployment and the investments, you know, we, we don't want to try to do everything all at once. So we had to go, you know, we had to only pick one horse to ride, I guess, is the way to put it, when it comes to the COVID-19 uh, vaccine portfolio because, you know, we, we do need to also obviously concurrently be moving forward with the antifibrotics, what we want to do with iBio 400 and the rest. Um, so, you know, that's, it's still something that we want to advance. We just have focused our energies on 201 instead in the meantime. All right. Well, along those lines, um, I noticed that you're advertising for a head of oncology. Um, and I was wondering if the VL platform, VLP platform would tie into that, but um, uh, the head of oncology is of, of interest. Um, is there any comment you have on that as to where the iBio might be going in, in, in terms of oncology? Well, so, uh, our, so interesting notation on that posting. Uh, yes, indeed. Uh, let me see. I guess what I would say is that as we shared earlier here in the remarks, we do see our ability to take our glycaneering technologies combined with fast farming to, in particular, be able to 
manipulate some of the sugars on, for instance, a monoclonal antibody such that in particular for indications in oncology that you can make them more potent. You know, you'll, folks can see in the literature there's something called ADCC, uh, antibody dependent cellular cytotoxicity, where if you can, in particular, when it comes to, uh, you know, glycan engineering, if you can remove a certain kind of sugar from a monoclonal antibody, you can give it a greater ADCC. And so because of that and some of uh, the other data that we have in hand, and we have a history actually with some earlier work done in the company on uh, you know, a, a monoclonal antibody uh, by the name of Rituxan, we do think that there's a lot of opportunity there for us. And as a matter of fact, we have experience now um, with 10, uh, arguably a little closer to a dozen, uh, anti-cancer monoclonal antibodies. So that's, you know, just what we have out there. We published on uh, some of that in the past. And, you know, the glycanearing technologies we underscore, and this is what I think makes the fast farming CDMO services more attractive, and this is part of the story we want to tell uh, to more and more customers that, you know, we can do oncology MABs well. Uh, so, you know, in, in part, you know, a, a leader for that program uh, who we think is important and, uh, you know, can really help us leverage the technology for, you know, opportunities that we want to explore in the space. But, you know, nothing definitive that we've, uh, you know, established there. We don't have any projects identified per se just yet here for that program, uh, but uh, that's, that's the nature of the position. All right, let me go with another one, quick one, I hope. On uh, 201, um, it's established we're, we're targeting the S and the N proteins. The website had a little blurb under the 201 section mentioning multiple proteins. And I'm wondering, have, have you, your team, investigated also targeting like the E and or the M proteins as part of uh, the 201 therapy? So... I can't disclose or share some of the other uh, <laughs> okay. research activities that we may have, Jim, but... Uh, All right. You know, right. I don't want you to say anything uh, happy... I'm not supposed to say. Yes. <laughs> well, right. And, and here, you know, we're, we're obviously, you know, trying to be as transparent as we can. Um, here Without with, competitive you know, uh, giveaway, of course. Yes. Exactly. Exactly. All right. Let's move on. Hey, um, uh, to pin down the uh, rough timeline for 201, we... Man, I never calculated in data analysis. Um, in terms of months instead of quarters, what rough month, you know, like April or May or June, whatever, what month period do you think um, uh, that toxicology analysis would be done? And then when might an IND be filed? Best guess. Yeah, so I mean, I... I think what we want to say on that is, is really what we've already said, which is that early Q4, so you can kind of get your say if you cut the quarter in the middle, <laughs> you would want to figure it sometime in there. And again, we're not doing that uh, data uh, set analysis ourselves. We have a, you know, a third party provider that's doing that work. We've paid to have it expedited. Um, and so, you know, that is our expectation that we'll have that data in hand in the beginning of the quarter, um, and then you know, next quarter that is, and then we have to, you know, as I mentioned before, combine up that tox info with some of the other preclinical data um, that we want to generate on uh, N plus S together, as well as anything else that we might be doing with the vaccine. Look, the key is at the end: are we going to be able first? Is there going to be a market? Right is, is are what others predicting uh, about this becoming a seasonal uh, disease or illness? Uh, is that going to unfold? And then you know, can this solution in fact bring differentiation versus you know the mRNA and the and the adenovirus uh, based vaccines? I think those questions combined with our own performance 
you know, with the design that we have really are going to rule the day. And, you know, if we've got a good answer or a better answer, then, you know, we're going to press forward. If we don't or if the market conditions change or the, uh, the you know, uh, disease itself, uh, you know, if it winds up stabilizing or, you know, there's, here's the other thing, that, you know, a bunch of this, that it may become less lethal. Some are project, uh, projecting as you, as you see it uh, go through these various mutations and, and evolve. That could occur too. So, you know, we're going to have to weigh all those, uh, Jim, as we go, uh, because, you know, th that has to be considered as we make the portfolio decisions uh, for our pipeline. Does that make, make sense? Total sense. All right, I think that's it, and I'll let you go to the next one. Thank you so much. Thanks, Jim. We have our next question coming from the line of Jim Jones with Churchside Capital. Your line is open. Uh, hey, Tom, how you doing? Uh, first of all, thanks all for uh, taking our questions here, and I want to congratulate you on all of the new talent that we're seeing uh, coming in to join the team. Uh, additionally, uh, and this goes to my question, we have seen the launch of a new logo and a fantastic new website. And so we have these um, outward-facing brand changes that reflect a bullish direction for the company since the last call. And uh, it looks to me that a lot of things are starting to move in-house. So that said, I just wanted to ask quickly if there's plans to move things like um, investor relations in-house uh, and you spoke earlier in your opening statement about spreading the word on iBio, I and I wanted to find out if, you know, you have any plans to bring on strategic communications consultants or anyone that can help build shareholder value and really just kind of build the story because we believe in the story as retail, but uh, we'd love to see more people get that confidence. So, Jim, hey, thanks for uh, your questions, and – you know, look, in, in terms of talent, I, and I mentioned this before to other Jim uh, who, who, uh, who just preceded you, you know, I, I started off thanking, you know, a small team of people who helped us through some, you know, pretty challenging times in late 2019 and in early 2020. And, oh, by the way, it's been, uh, it's been quite a wild ride here through all of 2020 and up until this point. And I would say, you know, our investor relations partner um, was one of those groups. Um, as a matter of fact, the company had to dig out uh, from a really challenging uh, financing in October of 2019, and we had a lot of folks uh, help us get through that. Uh, I think as we move things forward, um, you know, and, and now that we've uh, brought on some help here into the organization, and, oh, by the way, you know, I, I want to give thanks here to uh, John Delta, who it was yet another uh, person and then part of a bigger group um, that provided certain outsourced services and support for our organization because we started this whole thing off with like a couple dozen people. Um, and that's, that was everybody in the organization, including, you know, line workers and admin folks in, in Texas, you name it. And so, uh, you know, we had to lean very heavily uh, on our uh, strategic uh, suppliers, vendors, support staff, and all the rest. So, uh, you know, I, I feel like as we go forward, I mean, hopefully you're seeing continuous improvement in all areas. You know, I, I, I come from a place where, you know, look, it's just never good enough. We, <laughs> we have started this journey, and we have a lot more to do for you and the rest of our investors. Um, hopefully you see at every turn each month, each week, um, we believe that we're not only building a strong foundation for the company, um, but generating real value, real assets um, here going forward. So whether it's something like the website, a pipeline addition, a novel deal that we do with a, with a unique business model, um, or heck, you know, just uh, you know, getting a commercial organization in place, um, you know, to start now that we've got the glycaneering plus fast farming and the service portfolio better defined, uh, going out and telling that story. Uh, look, you know, we're we're going to just keep doing better every day to the best of our ability because we think we've got something good here. And you know, again, I think it's a matter of turning on the machine uh, and using 
the capabilities of the platform to really strip that time out of that early stage product development cycle and you bring the ability to make higher quality products along with it and oh by the way eco-friendly and safer um, you bet and so you know you've got our commitment to keep working hard across all fronts all functions um, you know to you know to build a great company so uh, you know but thank you for the question and uh, that's it you've got our uh, commitment to continuous improvement in, in every facet We have our next question coming from the line of Matthew Herm. With Matthew Herm, LLC, your line is open. Hey, Tom, this is Matt. I appreciate you taking the question. Um, sure, you're aware. I know a lot about iBio. Uh, just have really a couple questions. And um, first of all, you know, want to recognize the progress that you've made. Uh, you know, I've heard the phrase a new iBio, um, and they're – you know, definitely some long-term, at least private retail investors who've been familiar with the company, uh, you know, beyond your personal involvement. Um, and, you know, to, to that end, uh, I think a lot of us who were involved, uh, you know, were focused on this partnership with uh, CC Farming as recently as 2019. You know, I think there were, you know, some visits to the PRC even, um, and a lot of you know, you know, even investor relations and press releases about that partnership. And since then, you know, we've heard that, you know, that's not really a partnership. They were a vendor. And at the same time, uh, you know, CCP and iBio are on the same line item uh, on the WHO list, even uh, for coronavirus vaccine candidates. Um, and, I, you know, I'd just like to leave it open-ended uh, to hear from you what is going on internationally with respect to, you know, licenses, patents, whether it's CCP, whether it's Azergen, whether it's South Africa or Korea, places we've not even heard of, uh, you know, how is that contributing to revenue? How is that a priority or a focus of any of the business these days? Because really, we, you know, I just have to comment, like, in 2019, that really seemed to be a huge focus. And if that's part of the new iBio, you know, we're on board. We just need to hear about that a little bit more with, with the transparency that you've promised us. So thanks again. I, I really do appreciate, again, like, it's a, it's a change in direction. Um, we, we just need to understand why. Well, Matt, thanks for your question. And, uh as well as your support, I, I think it's uh, it's possible that you, you may have even preceded me here with some of the involvements with uh, with iBio. So here's the good news: um, those relationships are still very much in place and, and very strong. And what I can say is relative to, and let me just break it down a little bit on CC farming. So you're right when it came to the COVID-19 vaccines. It wound up being that the two that iBio had, um, we were able to successfully manufacture and drive forward. Um, the version, a version of a vaccine that um, an antigen that CC Farming had, didn't actually materialize. So when it came to the COVID-19 stuff, it was more, you know, of a, of a vendor sort of relationship. Um, uh, as opposed to a partnership, because we didn't have anything to drive necessarily at that time to drive forward together on, other than eventually CC Farming could have, um, you know, taken our our COVID-19 vaccine forward into China, right? Um, however, when it comes to the rest of the relationship, that's still in place. And as a matter of fact, we we drove really hard towards the end of last fiscal year to um, deliver on the commitments that were in the, you know, in the statement of work and the contract that we had. So that's why we had a big quarter, um, relatively speaking, for iBio at the end of last fiscal year. That was, you know, a lot of that, and I think we spoke to this in our filings, was CC Farming. So you can see all that there. Um, you know, we have a very good relationship with the leadership over there. 
uh, and they are looking at different strategies themselves. Um, but obviously, I can't I can't speak to that too much. So that relationship is still still strong, and we delivered on everything that we had in place. And when it comes to some of the others, and you know, we have named Azergen. So I would say same thing. Um, you know, we have a, a very good uh, relationship with Moritz, the CEO over there. And in terms of them executing to their strategy, we're helping them um, here all along the way. And uh, notably, to the earlier question around oncology, in both of the relationships, the first start was with that molecule rituxan or rituximab um, in the generic sense. So, you know, we're happy that those relationships are there. We do have active work, um, certainly with Azergen uh, right now. So, you know, we've, we've changed some things, but we've, we've in no way, shape, or form, you know, given up on our CDMO services, factory solutions, and, and things that help our partners overseas uh, be able to adopt, utilize the platform to their own uh, business goals here and along the way. So uh, great questions. I hope that clarifies things a little bit, um, you know, but we're still strong with those relationships. And in fact, uh, obviously I can't speak to them, but we um, have other international partners that we're speaking with right now and, you know, may or may not uh, be able to move some of those forward to agreements. Um, but XUS or X North America, uh, we're still active. We have now reached the allotted time for today's call. I will now turn the call back over to Tom Isaac. All right, well, I would say once again, everyone, thanks for your time and attention today. Uh, and uh, thank you for joining. We look forward to updating you again on our next call. Thanks again. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your participation. That concludes the presentation. You may now disconnect and have a wonderful day.